What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. It's Teach coming back at you with another 2025 two round mock draft. And yes, this time around, we actually do have a little bit of movement. We do have a trade in today's video. So excited to go ahead and break down the next 64 picks in this updated mock draft. We're getting closer and closer to April. So if this is up your alley, be sure to subscribe, hit that like button if you want to see more. And of course, most importantly, join me for a conversation down below in the comment section. Who goes too high? Who falls too low? Who's your favorite squad? And did you like the picks that I gave your favorite team? Let's waste no time. Let's kick things off. The New England Patriots. They'll be starting Drake May this weekend. I'm excited about that. He was my you know, QB 1B last year. So in a spot where I don't think quarterback kind of have to come off the board here. Pat's already got to have that figured out, in my opinion. I'm going to go with Travis Hunter. If it's not a quarterback to me, it, just the value. He's not the number one corner. He's not the number one receiver in this class. But he's top five in both. And, uh, man... The more I watch him at Colorado, I think there's a world where, uh, personally, I'm drafting him as a corner, just for reference, uh, in case you're new around here. I uh, 50 snaps on the defensive side, 20, 25 on the offensive side. Use him on like specialist, you know, third down packages, red zone stuff, where his ball skills can really play. I think there's a world where you can make this work for, you know, 70, 80 snaps a week. It's a little bit more than your regular player might play. But, man, I just think that's how you get the maximum skill set out of this guy. And can you imagine... A defense and like a money down situation where New England is trotting out Christian Gonzalez and Travis Hunter, like both their movement skills and their understanding for man coverage. But you're you're seeing clips on Twitter now. What I've been saying this whole time: Travis Hunter in zone coverage is going to be a problem the next level. And by the way, the most man heavy team from a season ago, not this current season, was the Cleveland Browns, and they still ran man half the time. And the other fifty percent of the time was zone. So he's he's showcasing what he can do in a zone heavy defense uh, with the flashes we see at Colorado, and that's what I, that that personally that plus Christian Gonzalez and his fluidity, his ball skills that I think are coming along. Man, that would excite me a ton. Plus, this team needs more playmakers on the offensive side. So Travis Hunter, no doubt there. Uh, another no brainer here: the Cincinnati Bengals. We'll go Mason Graham. This is probably the most this, and then like. The Patriots, I guess, with like Kelvin Banks or um, Will Campbell, probably some of the picks you see most often uh, in NFL mock drafts. But given the current draft order, which is what we're basing this off of, Mason Graham for a team that desperately needs an overhaul of that interior defensive line, plus you reunite him with Chris Jenkins. I'm not saying it'd be to this level, but you see what happens with the Rams, right? You got Verse and Fisk. They play off each other so well. Maybe you could have something like that in Cincinnati if they could get their hands on someone like a Mason Graham Ultimately, I don't think they pick this high, but dude, Mason Graham would be the perfect add to that defense. Pass rush help for Hendrickson. Interior reinforcements against the run. And hopefully him and Chris Jenkins could play off each other and see what they get out of Jenkins that much more, hopefully. To the Los Angeles Rams uh, here at three, I'm going to go with Will Johnson. Um, you know, this team just desperately needs a corner. Trey White, once a very fun player, one of my favorite corners in the league to watch. Unfortunately, he's washed at this point. Uh, and they do have Darius Williams, who's a good player, but... Will Johnson, very different ceiling. I know he had that late penalty against Washington last week, and, and maybe that game against the Huskies wasn't his best. I'd certainly say it wasn't. But um, he still made enough plays this year to where you see the holistic upside. Um, and he was banged up going to that game against Washington. So take a look. Yes, he's coming off a rough week, but if you take a look at the entire you know package here, I don't need to sell you on Will Johnson. He's obviously someone who should go in the top five. To the Cleveland Browns, I'm going to go with quarterback Jalen Milrow. Uh, first time having him go in the first round in one of these box. Um and to be honest, I probably won't be doing updated position rankings uh, throughout the course of this season. Maybe around Christmas time, I'll, I'll do something then. But odds are probably not. One because those videos just don't typically do as many clicks. Uh, so you know, for me to do this on top of everything else I do, you know, time has got to match up the views. Um, that being said, um, another reason is Jalen Milrow. Like I feel like I'm going to need every single game's all 22 before I can fully make an evaluation. Uh, because I think you're already seeing growth from last year to this year, and I think you're going to even see it just from the beginning of this year to the end of this year. Um, and of course, most recently, Bama coming off the loss to Vandy, but you know, follow Jordan Reed if you're not already. Uh, what are you doing? Go follow him on Twitter. But you know, he was posting clips showing Jalen Milrow and the growth he's made as an intermediate passer. And yeah, they lost that game, but that's the stuff that makes Milrow scary. He already had the deep ball. He's already got a good feel for that. It's the mundane. Can he start hitting those first and 10 slants? Can he second and 10 at that backside dig? If he starts winning underneath intermediate as a passer, on top of everything else there physically, as a runner, as a deep ball thrower, you're talking about a guy who's 
got the highest ceiling of any quarterback in this class and should be QB1, right? And uh, for the Browns, you know, Deshaun Watson's a disaster. You're paying him no matter what. The only thing that can make a bad decision worse is trying to force that bad decision to work. Um, you know, I heard somebody say, which I thought was kind of funny, the only thing worse than paying uh, a square peg to fit into a round hole is trying to then force that square peg to then continue to fit in that round hole, which kind of feels like the Deshaun Watson thing. So Dylan Milrow, get a cheap quarterback, try to counteract the uh, weight of that Deshaun Watson contract. Jacksonville Jaguars here at five. I'm going to go with Kelvin Banks. Uh, him and Will Campbell like him both a ton. I could see equal opportunity for both those guys being the first offensive tackle off the board. Banks, to me, love what he brings as an upside pass protector. And when he connects on run plays, you see the power he has. Just needs to be a little bit more consistent with that. Him and Cam Williams have been fantastic this year at Texas. We'll talk about Cam Williams a little bit later on. And uh, Cam Robinson, last year of his contract, this would be a no-brainer for me. Get that franchise left tackle uh, for Trevor Lawrence. And then, you know, I know they're coming off a win, but probably time to also change up that coaching staff. Get a new offensive scheme in that building. Carolina Panthers are next up here at six. I'm going to go with Cam Ward. He's kind of made the rise. Him and Milrow feel like if you pull most draft you know, fans and draft analysts, one of the two of those guys is probably QB1 right now. And then Sanders is probably the other name that's most often mentioned as QB1. Uh, been really impressed with Cam Ward. Uh, you see the, the arm talent. To me, like the, he... You see a lot of Geno Smith comps to Shadir Sanders, and like I think he throws over the top, and the motion looks like Geno Smith. But to me, when it comes to velocity, and even just what we see from Geno in Seattle, he's not the most god-tier athlete, but he's got enough to create, and he wants to create, and he's really good at it once he does leave the pocket. And we've also seen Geno the last few weeks use his legs. And I think all that is true for Cam Ward. He just has a few more throwing angles, because again, like I think Shadir, yeah, definitely has that over-the-top Geno look to him. But, like, Cam Ward has, like, I think a Geno base set, but with, like, Matt Stafford throwing angles. And to me, that's, like, one hell of a combination. So um, I'm also a sucker for a guy who goes from one level of comp to another. And we've seen Ward do that twice now. Incarnate Ward to Washington State. Leave the Pac-12, as every other team did. Um, actually, Washington State's still in the Pac-12, technically. But Ward left it. And now, balling out at Miami. And again, kind of Staff Stafford comp here. He, sometimes he creates the fire that he then has to put out later in the game. Uh, but nevertheless, he does put out that fire. Done it back-to-back weeks against Tech and Cal. We'll see. I'd like to see him avoid those situations it's like a pitcher. You don't want to see your pitcher fall behind 3-0. But hey, if he gets a strikeout at the end of it, then... You can live with it for a little bit, but been really impressed with Cam Ward. Love the arm talent there. Speaking of Shadir Sanders, that's going to be the pick here at seven to the Tennessee Titans. You know, Bill Callahan, Brian Callahan, specifically Brian here, coming from Cincinnati, working with Joe Burrow, who doesn't have elite arm strength, but is top notch pretty much everywhere else. In a lot of ways, you can compare Shadir Sanders to that, right? Like, it's probably like a C plus to B, you know, level arm, but it, it'll play the next level. I really don't have any concerns with that. And honestly, I think just like Burrow. You could add a little bit of that, you know, uh, with, you know, NFL strength and conditioning uh, and getting more of that lower half, you know, kind of boost it up. Uh, but just from a decision making standpoint, right now you got Brian Callahan looking at Will Levis, who, you know, hand up, like big Will Levis fan here, still hoping that he can turn it around. But you got Callahan right now saying, what the F are you doing on the sideline versus Shadir Sanders, who's as cerebral and a great processor, as high a level processor you're going to see in this class. So when it comes to above the shoulders, I think this is the quarterback that Callahan would be desperate to go find the guy that he doesn't have to you know coach up why you don't like fall to your knees and then throw it you know right or how you don't see Jay Alexander waiting for you to make that that hitch throw all that's taken out for Shadir Sanders um there's a lot of other ways you could go with this team you know I still think you know receiver D hop boy they're gonna both probably be gone next year could definitely go there but as much as I like Will Levis you know they're they're gonna start him this upcoming Sunday because you have to do your due diligence and at the end of the year if you know he's not your guy Picking here at seven, it's a good opportunity to go get a guy that I do think fits what Callahan would want. Miami Dolphins, I'm going to go with Benjamin Morrison here. I've done corner. Um, it's a little rich for me to go into your offensive line here. Um, they drafted Patrick Paul last year, so I think they're set at left tackle, um, at least for you know a year. I don't think you have to do it this season. Um, so I'm going to go Benj Mor Benjamin Morrison, you know, um, get a little old that second corner spot and Fuller there. Jalen Ramsey himself getting up there in age. Um, also, maybe he's just a guy that you might want to move it into the nickel. Um, I don't know, just given his age and, you know, the trajectory of quarters, uh, trajectory of corners once you get up and over 30. Um, but Benjamin Morrison, man, love the click and close ability. Athletic freak, just not as big and as physical as Will Johnson. But from a coverage standpoint, Benjamin Morrison, I think, brings a lot to the table. Um, and this is, you know, and also, of course, disclaimer, I have to talk about quarterback here. I'm not going to... 
I'm not a professional and I'm definitely not like a neurologist. I certainly cannot imagine what's going on in the head of Tua Tagovailoa. If I had to guess though, they make those like helmet caps. And to me, I don't know why he wasn't wearing one in the first place, but you have to think post buy, post Tua's return, he's going to have that cap on. And I like to think that's going to keep him much more available and prevent some of those future head injuries. So it sounds like Miami wants him to come back. Sounds like Tua himself wants to come back. So for right now, I'm going to go forward with that assumption. Dolphins fans, let me know what you think ultimately happens. Personally, I would say just go ahead and retire, but it does sound like the, the Dolphins are moving forward with two in mind. Anyways, let's get to the Jets here at number nine. Layup pick, Tetsuro and McMillan. I mean, Alan Lazard leads the league in drop rate right now. Come on. Come on. The only reason he's on a roster right now is because he's Aaron Rodgers' buddy, because um, otherwise that wouldn't fly for any other team. So just imagine Alan Lazard, but more athletic, less drop issues, can beat man coverage, but also has the wherewithal to be a really solid zone coverage player. Oh, and not to mention a way better yards after the catch threat. And I say that with, yeah, I know Alan Lazard, one of his touchdowns on a little you know bubble screen makes a dude miss and he gets in the end zone a couple weeks ago. No, I know. I remember that play. But McMillan still does it at a higher level. So, uh, yeah, this would just be clear as day. And I think as a compliment to Garrett Wilson, this would be absolutely fire. Um, and again, not going quarterback here. I've heard that it sounds like Rodgers this year. Also, the plan is for Rodgers next year. But we'll see. Obviously, change the coaching staff. We'll see. Maybe this all kind of ruffles the feathers and Rodgers decides to hang it up. And we're addressing quarterback moving on. But we just don't have that clarity right now. To the Las Vegas Raiders here at 11. I'm going to have to go quarterback in this spot, too. Uh, it's just clear that they don't have their franchise guy on the roster. Quinn Ewers continues to battle injuries. But up until that abdomen strain this year, I think you saw a guy that the game was moving much slower for him. And it wasn't just, hey, he's really rising in the moment in these big games. It felt like every game was just moving at a speed that which he could, you know, comprehend and, and take full advantage of the weapons around him, right? This is still a loaded Texas roster. You have a couple of, you know, first two round receivers and tight end that goes in the top 100 and uh, a running back goes in the top 50. All that's gone, but they still have a ton of weapons there in Texas and they have a great offensive mind in Steve Sarkeesian. So, um, yeah, you were a big couple of weeks. He's obviously got the Red River rivalry this upcoming weekend, you know, the day after you're seeing this when I post on Friday. Um, and then the next week, it's also uh, a big one for Texas against Georgia. So a couple of games up ahead to see what yours is really all about. That being said, the big game has not really been the issue for Quinn Ewers. It's been the mundane games, the boring ones, where he's kind of lacked consistency. This year, I think it's looked a little different. Arizona Cardinals here at 11. I'm going to go with Abdul Carter. If I had to guess, he's going to end the year as my edge one. Uh, the last two weeks, pass rush win rate close to 24%. I even think the first couple of weeks of the year, maybe he wasn't getting sacks and getting home, but... For a first-year starter, I didn't think the hand placement was all that bad. And he still obviously has the ability to win with speed and you know bend off the edge. But now we're starting to see the inside counters and the power really come into play. And uh, obviously getting the quarterback more often and beating the guy across from him. So I think he's really starting to you know find that next switch, uh, take it to another gear. And I think by the end of the year, we're talking about Abdul Carter as edge one and probably going higher than 11. And I would just love to see a world where Darius Robinson, Abdul Carter, two very different body types, two very different ways of getting to the quarterback, but two guys I think could definitely do it on a down and down out basis for the Arizona Cardinals. Let's get to the New Orleans Saints here at 12. I'm going to go back to the edge well, Nick Scorton. I think this team's still looking for answers and a long-term replacement to Cam Jordan. Hasn't been Isaiah Foskey. It hasn't been Pat, uh, Peyton Turner yet. Um, Granderson's a good player, but he's got flexibility. You can kind of play him all over the defensive line. Um, I also don't hate Deion Walker here. You know, Brian Brzee to this point, someone I liked out of the draft, but still waiting to see him, you know, flip that switch. So, you know, Walker or Scorton here, I think makes a lot of sense. But Scorton right now probably is the best, most diverse move set and coming off an awesome game against Missouri where he really did look like a top 10 pick in that game against Mizzou. To the Colts, uh, been a while since I've done this, but Colston Loveland, uh, you know, it's a team that I like the receiver uh, play, especially now that Alec Pierce has remembered, you know, he's a deep threat and an athletic freak. Uh, so when A.D. Mitchell's your receiver four, I think you're in a good spot. The tight end group, I think, can be better. Moelle Cox, it's always fun to see, a, you know, former VC Ram get into the end zone, but that kind of feels like a novelty play, you know, a bit of a gimmick. Um, and I think, you know, just an overall starting point, I think Loveland gives them a lot more there than the guys they currently have on the roster. And also, he's become a pretty solid and dependable blocker, which I think makes this offense that much more import, uh, potent. They already have one of the best offensive lines in football. Throw at a guy who's a competent you know, blocker to be a fifth and a half offensive lineman for our backfield that features AR and Jonathan Taylor. Sign me up for that. We get to the Giants here at 14. This is where we're going to have our trade. The Giants are going to move back. Um, I don't know if the Pittsburgh Steelers move up. 
I don't necessarily know if this trade would go down on draft day, but hey, it's October 11th. Give me a little grace here. It's going to be a one three five in exchange for a uh, I think a, I think it was just this fourth right here back. Uh, so three picks for the cost of two. Um, Pittsburgh comes up and they draft Luther Burden. Uh, it's just clear if you watch the Steelers. And look, let me just get off my soapbox. If the Steelers change quarterbacks at any point this year, the, it, the offense is only going to get more more inefficient. It's only going to get worse in my from my standpoint. If they start Russell Wilson, I get it. People perceive him as a better passer. But also Justin Fields and his rushing ability gives us more single high looks. I think with Russell Wilson under center, Pittsburgh gets stopped down in, down out by two high shells that they won't consistently run defenses out of. Um, but all that to say, let's say it's Fields under center next year. This team needs a separator. For whatever reason, they just don't want to play Romeo or Roman Wilson healthy scratch again. I get he missed training camp, but for a team that's desperately looking for a separator, they seem to be ignoring the one on roster. I don't know why that is. But also, you just look at Burden's yards after the catch ability, and that feels like a dude that Arthur Smith can be pounding the table for. So, feels like the receiver type that they're missing, um, and he feels like a guy that really would match what Arthur Smith's doing. And honestly, if you're starting Justin Fields, you're playing, a, at this point, even his best games, you're still playing within a certain game script, right? You're still trying to just, you know, it's not a whole lot of deep passing. It's mostly using him as a runner, opening up what else you can have in the run game too because a backside defender can't crash when it could be a read option or a zone read. Burden kind of fit that. You know, get him into space, easy throw, let a playmaker be a playmaker, that sort of stuff. So he kind of matches their game script and how they want to win games too. On to the Seattle Seahawks here at pick 15. This is where the fall is going to end for Will Campbell. I do understand he plays left tackle right now, but I think you're at a spot now where tackles are making this flip more often than not. So let's go ahead and have him go over to the right side of the offensive line. Um, and ultimately, I just, I don't, as much as I like Abe Lucas when he plays, he's just, he's not out there enough. Um, and Stone Forsyth is like a full second behind whoever he's lined up with. I mean, I know Nick Bosa has a crazy get off, but if you watch that Thursday night game, you're like, dude, he's, he's not even starting anywhere close to when Bosa is. So. I think right tackle is a spot that the, the Seahawks are just going to have to address. Maybe they do in free agency, but here, Will Campbell, a guy that probably should go a lot higher than 15, falls in your lap. Yes, you're asking him to flip sides, but I think that's a thing that someone that technically refined will be able to make happen a okay. And next up is the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm going to go back to the offensive line here. This is where we're going to have Cameron Williams come off the board. Been thoroughly impressed for someone as big and as agile as he is. Uh, not someone who was really on a lot of people's draft radars, uh, but now added into these mock draft simulators on PFF. Mock draft database has already got him in here. Yeah, I, I'm thinking this guy's got a shot to go in the first round. Like him and Josh Simmons, to me, clear cut winners so far this season when it comes to offensive linemen and specifically offensive tackles. And you're looking at this Eagles team who, like, when Lane Johnson's not in the lineup, the offense doesn't operate the same. So I think it's time to go ahead and find that contingency. Yes, it's a first-round pick for a contingency, but when you look at how big of a strength that offensive line has been, and specifically the play of Lane Johnson, I think it's worth making that first-round investment. Even if that means there's some overlap where Cam Williams can't play that much his rookie year, he's just kind of a fill-in guy, I think that's totally fine. We tend to see offensive linemen, more often than not, they need a year to potentially two to really hit the ground running. So it ultimately might be the best thing for Cam Williams as well. But here the Eagles get their Lane Johnson replacement long-term. To the Chicago Bears. Let's go to the edge group. I'm going to go with James Pierce Jr. He's fallen a little bit in this mock. You know, he's just overall, the play hasn't been super special, uh, but the movement skills are still there. So this is going to be a combine warrior, someone that a team somewhere in the first round is going to be like, edge rushers don't move that fast and they don't have that type of bend. We'll figure out everything else. I still think, you know, he's a guy that kind of like Dallas Turner a year ago. I was like, man, if he can go back to school and get 10 pounds of muscle at an inside counter, and then we start to see, oh, he can play with power more consistently. Sometimes he has a bull rush that works, but it's kind of, it's it's a pitch you don't see often. So that I think it really catches tackles off guard. It could be something that with more power, he goes to more consistently. And then, like I said, with Dallas Turner, you started to see him add that inside counter. If James Pierce Jr. adds that, then you're talking about a guy who, you know, preseason we're talking about, oh, maybe he's the number one pick then you can kind of get him in that range. But I don't, his body looks the same, doesn't seem to be any more bulked up. And I haven't seen an inside counter that's really wowed me and said, okay, wow, this dude totally added that to his repertoire. So it's kind of the same bag of tricks as last year. And because of that, I think, you know, college teams are playing him a little bit better. 
and the production has to totally follow suit. But there's enough traits there to say, hey, first round pick, he's a very different style of edge rusher than Montez Sweat, which would make for a lot of fun where you get to move those two guys around and play mismatch against opposing tackles, Pierce and Montez Sweat. That sounds like a lot of fun for what has already been one of the better defenses in the NFL. Green Bay Packers here at 18. This is where I'm going to have Dino Walker come off the board. Um, could go edge here too. I don't hate that. Um, part of this is going to come down to ultimately, what is Lucas Van Ness? You know, I'm, I'm starting to come around to the idea that mm, maybe he is a better interior guy. Um, and I wonder if they're just going to bulk him up to get him there. But then that kind of opens up a spot on the edge that, uh, you know, Kingsley and Agbury was someone I liked a ton coming out of South Carolina. And I think he's been their probably second best edge rusher so far. But they haven't given him that full time starting role. Maybe for a reason. So, Edge or IDL, Packers fans, tell me what your preference is. Tell me what you think ultimately LVN is long-term. I saw him as an edge, but I don't know. At his current weight, you, you might just want to say, hey, can you get up to 290, 295 legit and then just play on the inside? That might ultimately be, might ultimately be the direction they go in. That being said, if they don't, Deion Walker's an awesome athletic monster at 367 pounds. So, like, totally fits that get uphill, you know, really nice running mate next to someone uh, like Devontae Wyatt. And he's such a huge human being that he's going to clog the middle in the run game, too. So, a lot of different benefits that Walker would bring to the table for the Packers. All right, let's get on to San Francisco 49ers. Different name to bring to the table here. And Johnny Cornelius, uh, man, been so impressed with him this year at Oregon. I mean, you're talking about elite PFF grade overall, fantastic in the run game, and then more than held his own in the pass game. So to me, been the more impressive of the two Oregon tackles. I think he's going to be a workout warrior. The frame checks out. And right now, you know, last time we had a mock, we went edge for the 49ers. Actually, I think I gave him James Pierce Jr. And, and still, I think the trenches are a spot where this team can get better. So Colton McKivitt's one-year deal to me, a totally replaceable guy. Let's go get a higher ceiling. The movement skills of Cornelius definitely fits that blocking scheme. Or again, if James Pierce Jr. is here, like that's the type of edge rusher they wanted Drake Jackson to be, Leonard Floyd, you know, that, things like that. So I'm also cool with edge here. So tackle edge. Again, it's a little early for me to go into your defensive line uh, or into your offensive line, excuse me, for the 49ers. All right, let's get to the Chargers. They got a couple of impending free agents on the edge. So I'm going to go with Jack Sawyer. You could definitely go with Michael Williams here. I think they could be impressed with the upside there. But uh, I'm going to have the Michigan guys drafted Ohio State Buckeye. Why not, right? But I said preseason. I think Sawyer's going to be the guy who steals the show on that Ohio State defensive line. And to this point, you look at the PFF grade, he's been stellar. JTT has more sacks, but ultimately it hurries Sawyer's way. And then overall pass rush grade goes in the favor of Jack Sawyer. Five-star recruit coming to high school, twitchy athlete, can be used in a variety of ways, but I think he's really figuring it out as a pass rusher. And I think long-term, Sawyer, JT Tuomaloau, I mean, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Tuli Tuopolotu, that could be your long-term tandem there for the Los Angeles Chargers, uh, depending on what happens with Mos Bosa and Mack this upcoming offseason. Then we get back to the Giants here at 21 after the trade down. This is, we're going to have Carson Beck come off the board. And part of it is like, I could have gone no trades in this mock draft, but at this point, I can't have Luther Burden not come off the board before Carson Beck, just because like if you look at my big board and how I view these guys, Burden's a better player, so he needs to come off the board first. But this would be an interesting thing here for the Giants, right? You get an extra third, you get an extra fifth uh, at the cost of a fourth, and obviously you move it down to the first. But then you get to get a guy who, yeah, Carson Beck's the first half against Bama wasn't great, but that second half, they said, hey, Carson, give us a shot. That second half was all him. You know, he, he's hitting playmakers on the money, making a bunch of big time throws. Ultimately, does have that late pick, but some of that's also like receiver, go up, make a play, stack that corner. You got you got to hold up your share of the bargain as well, because um, ball placement wise, not terrible. It's not like the Rodgers back shoulder that was at Mike Williams' ankle last week in London. I, the ball placement's not nearly as bad there for Beck. Um, and the Giants, you know, hey, if they keep winning with Daniel Jones, you don't have to force Beck onto the field. He might ultimately benefit from a year's buffer as well. And then you get to write out the last year of that Daniel Jones contract. So it's kind of a win-win. But ultimately, I don't think Daniel Jones is like super high ceiling, got to keep this guy around, dude, for the Giants. So odds are this is like a handing of the torch from Daniel Jones to Carson Beck's. Carson Beck, excuse me. And let's see what Brian Dayball can do and see if he can hit a ceiling. Uh, and, you know, for Carson Beck, it's like, hey, you got Malik Neighbors. In that second half against Georgia, he's just facilitating. He's getting the ball out to playmakers, making a lot of big-time throws. If he can do that with Malik Neighbors on the roster, could be a fun offense. All right, to the Denver Broncos. I'm going to have Isaiah Bond be the pick here at 22. A little bit of an overlap. Marvin Mims, who was one of my favorite mid-round guys from his draft. But at this point, Bond is just the better prospect. Um, and I just think that type of explosiveness, big playability, the speed, just get it to him, yards after the catch, or he could be a field stretcher. Nice compliment there for Cortland Sutton. 
But all in all, it's a receiver room that I'm kind of like, what direction are they going in when it comes to 2025? Like, I have no idea. Is Sutton on the roster next year? I'm kind of doubting that. And then, like, Josh Reynolds, is he kind of just a fill-in guy? Do they want to play Marvin Mims? Don't seem like they're in a rush to do that. So a lot of question marks for that receiver room. So I kind of just had to go receiver because I don't think they're super wild by any of the guys currently there. Let's go ahead and give them my receiver three slash four. I don't know. I go back and forth with him and Travis Hunter. I think Bond's got a little bit more nuance to his route running, and he's got more big playability, in my opinion, just from a speed standpoint. But, man, throw the ball in the direction of Travis Hunter. It's like not many that he doesn't come down with, right? You know, those types of ball skills are hard to find. Anyways, Dallas Cowboys are next up. Easy pick here. Ashton GT. I mean, this is a team that, hey, Rico Daddle's starting to run the ball well. I think the soft line's coming along well. But Rico Daddle, you're going to tell me he's got anywhere near the juice Ashton GT does? All right, yeah, I didn't think so. Plus, they haven't really asked him to be a pass catcher, but he's more than capable of that. You go into his tape from 2023-24, uh, you see a ton of pass catch work. So this could, you know, this is the best of both worlds. You get a more explosive guy, but also a more proven pass catcher than Dowdle and uh, than Zeke Elliott. So, uh, and I know you get Deuce Vaughn there, but honestly, again, just give me Gene T all day, any day. Uh, and he could go higher than this, uh, but, you know, Derrick Henry was a second rounder, you know, like, you know, sometimes dudes just fall because of that position value. Uh, but Gene is going to be a really interesting prospect. Also, like, I don't think he's helped by top 10 pick B. John Robinson. I don't think he's the guy that's turning around the Falcons right now. You know, maybe this is the week against Carolina. I'm actually really liking B. John props this week against the Panthers. Saquon Barkley, not even a giant anymore. He was one of their best players, no doubt. But like you took him number two overall. Did he change the trajectory of that franchise? I'd say no. Um, and then you go back to Zeke Elliott. You know, some good years there in Dallas, but did he change the trajectory of that team like Dak Prescott, the fourth rounder, did? The answer is no. So, yeah, I mean, there's other top 10 running backs that don't really help Gene's case either. I mean, Jameer Gibbs at 12 certainly does, but those top 10 picks don't. But anyways, I digress. Talking about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers here at 24. I think this team could still use a little bit of help on the edge. Michael Williams, a very different type of edge rusher than Yaya Diaby. Also a guy you can move up and down that defensive line. You're starting to see Logan Hall pick it up, so I would assume Michael Williams is just going to keep him on the edge. Hall is going to be one of those interior players with Kalaja Kansi and with Vita Vea. Um, but I'm, cool, I'm totally cool with that. Built in a lab to be an edge rusher. Freaky long arms. Wish we could, I would just wish he didn't have the injury this year for Georgia so we could see him out there more. Uh, but a guy that just like the more reps we can get with this guy, better understanding of where he is currently as a pass rusher makes this evaluation that much easier. That being said, he's also being helped by Trayvon Walker coming off a huge week last year, or excuse me, a huge week last week. Uh, and that type of like, hey, it took a little bit of time, but the ball of clay is moldable. That's going to certainly help Michael Williams be seen as a first rounder because another team's going to be like, hey, Jags did it with Trayvon. We can do it with Michael. Let's get on to the Buffalo Bills here at pick 25. I think it's been a little under-discussed how big of a loss Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde have been for this team. Not that their defense is terrible. Don't get me wrong. It's been fine. But when you had the best safety tandem in football for, what, half a decade to a decade? And, and now they're both gone? You know, that's, that's a huge, huge hill to overcome. A huge obstacle to try to battle through. And to me, pretty clear cut, best safety in the class. Malachi Starks can play him in the nickel, which right now when Teron Johnson's hurt, that would be nice, right? Like Cam Lewis is like just not really playing at the same level as Teron Johnson. You know, he's the backup for a reason. Malachi Starks helps fill that gap. He can play free safety. He can play strong safety. Name it, he can do it. So whether it's Taylor Rapp and him or Tamar Hamlin and him, Malachi Starks fits somewhere on the field. And I think he's a huge infusion of talent versus the guys that currently have on the roster. To the Baltimore Ravens, um, we're going to go to the edge spot here. I'm going to go with Josiah Stewart. Again, this guy's going to come way up the board here. Ton of speed, ton of explosiveness off the edge. Another Michigan edge rusher with that kind of profile. So it's like, hey, isn't this already David Ajabo? Yeah, maybe. You could say that. But uh, I don't think that should be the reason why you stop drafting the best edge rusher here. And actually, the next two picks are also going to be edge rushers. So this is just truly me saying, hey, I think Stewart's better slightly than these other two guys, including the guy who's going to go next, who I've been pounding the table for this whole cycle. Uh, but yeah, Josiah Stewart, what he did a couple weeks ago, totally put him in that first round conversation. And I think that's one of the few spots on this Baltimore team where it's like, where could they get a little bit better? Especially on the defensive side, it's tough. I think edge rusher, try to get that double digit a year type of dude. And uh, that closer, right? Like, Owe seems to get a lot of pressure, but he doesn't always finish plays. I think Josiah Stewart could be that finisher. As promised, we're going to stick at the edge group here for a little bit. Princely Uman Mielin. Last couple of weeks have been a little more disappointing for me. And, of course, it's come as they've hit into SEC play and, of course, suffered a loss against uh, Kentucky in that same time frame. So 
hoping he gets back on track here as they continue to play some stiff competition. But even in those down games, I still think you're seeing someone who's fringe first to second round type of talent. Lots of bend, lots of speed off the edge. Plays with good power, too, especially for someone who's listed at, like, 255. Uh, so, Umami, I'm not going to say he's, like, the full package because he's still going late one. But I think a guy who's solid across the board, really. And uh, when you look at Atlanta, that, that might be the weakest pass rush in the NFL right now. Um, you know, and, and I mean, Judon, one year, don't know if he's coming back. So, a lot of question mark there on the edge group. So, first round investment somewhere. It could be Uman Mielin. Or it could be this guy that I'm going to have go to the Detroit Lions. Ashton Gelati, about the only guy for Louisville getting any sort of pressure against SMU. Tough loss there for the Cardinals to take. But I still like the power profile that Gelati uh, brings to the table. And to me, he's a perfect complement for the spin move master in Aiden Hutchinson right now. One guy with power, one guy with speed and finesse. Mixed match against these tackles because both these guys will move around. Also, Gelati, like, if you get banged up or some injuries on the interior, he's flexible enough to be able to move inside. So... A lot of flexibilities, just in case, you know, kind of value that he brings to the table there. But ideal world, third and 13, him, Hutchinson are both pinning their ears back, going after the quarterback, and they do it in very different ways, which I love. Then we get to the Washington Commanders. I'm going to go with Siobhan Ravel here. Still think he should be a first rounder. There wasn't really a game on his schedule that that he's now going to miss that I'm like, oh, that was the big game competition that I needed to see. Ultimately, whatever your evaluation was at the end of last year was probably going to be about the same at the end of this year. But he's got the size, and he's got absolutely twitchy athleticism. And yes, he just blew his ACL, but we're seeing guys come back from that injury and be the same, if not maybe marginally better. Uh, in some instances, ask Adrian Peterson, 2,000-yard season the next year, or almost at the rushing record, might I add to that. So I, I really have no concerns about Siobhan Ravel. I think he's going to be just fine post-injury. And this is a secondary that, like, I was super excited about Benjamin St. Juice coming to Minnesota. That's an L. He just is not cutting it. And I get it. this defense has played better over the last couple of weeks, but Kyler Murray's up and down. Deshaun Watson's a mess, you know, so so that's also the competition and the week that they caught those guys. Um, but I just think this team needs an infusion of talent at that corner position. Siobhan Rebell, get him while he's fallen. I think it's a great spot for them to take advantage of a, a talent that should go higher than 29. Let's get to the Houston Texans here at 30. Same pick as last time, just because why not? You make it a Buckeye backfield. Quinchon Judkins. I mean, Joe Mixon, obviously, you know, he's upset with the hip drop tackle that caused him to miss so much time this year. But a man at that age, with the amount of wear and tear that he has from his career, it's probably about time to start looking at a long-term replacement. And Damian Pierce just doesn't fit that wide zone scheme. Cam Akers is out here getting replaced by Daria Gumbawale. And let's just let's just say to put it nicely, Judkins has a little bit more juice than Akers and Agumba Wale in my eyes. So, absolute clear-cut upgrade. And there's a world where you can keep mixing around with Judkins and kind of have them play off one another. Um, but yeah, I think this brings a lot more home run threat for a zone scheme that's looking for that guy to one cut, hit the hole, make a big play happen, i.e. Isaac Arendo, i.e. Jordan Mason last night with the 49ers. Slow it comes from that tree. Judkins is that back that they're looking for. Kansas City Chiefs here at 31. Let's go with Takario Davis. This team has gotten by without using a first-round investment at corner uh, other than Trent McDuffie, but he doesn't totally fit the same MO as like the Watson, you know, Jalen Watson there at corner, um, or even like a Legereus Sneed, later-round pick, these guys that are freakishly big and have crazy long arms. That being said, if they want to use a first-rounder for someone who fits that profile, I mean, Takario Davis, totally, totally that MO. Uh, so I would actually love to see them do this, make him an outside corner, move Trent McDuffie back to the inside, or honestly just have a matchup against the team's best receiver. I think that's totally fine. Whether it's in the slot or outside, just let McDuffie follow them around. Uh, but this is totally a Spagnuolo type of corner, and I, I'd be curious to see if they'd use a first-round investment. I've gone defensive line. I've gone tackles. So part of it, too, is I just kind of want to mix things up, not give you all the same picks week in and week out, right? Speaking of cornerbacks, let's give one to the Minnesota Vikings. They just have a ton of guys, soon to be free agents. They're all playing at a pretty high level right now. I wonder if they can maintain it for a full year with Gilmore. If so, this team's going to be legit and they're going to be, you know, contenders down to the wire. Obviously, a lot of that also dependent on Sam Darnold. But Denzel Burke schemed independent, you know, man zone, press off. I think he can fit whatever you want to do there. Six foot, 190 pounds, checks those boxes. Athletic testing is going to be more than clear for, uh, you know, uh, uh, medical standards and testing standards there. So, yeah, just kind of solid across the board. Gotten better and better year over year at Ohio State. I think a guy that could certainly step in and be a pretty much day one impact guy for the Vikings, depending on what they decide to do with the pieces that are impending free agents. Let's get on to the second round now. Kicking things off, the Cincinnati Bengals, Emeka Ekbuka. I just play him in a slot. 
you have some flexibility with Yoshivas and Chase. I'm going to assume that T. Higgins is gone. So I think you make Egbuka, Chase, you know, those guys can alternate inside out. Odds are Egbuka is probably just going to be your Tommy Boyd replacement. He'll be your slot guy. And you're playing Yoshivas and Chase on the outside. But you do have some flexibility, and I don't doubt that Egbuka could, on a few snaps, play outside. So a lot of flexibility there in that receiver room long term. All right, on to the Carolina Panthers here at 34. I'm going to actually go back to the Penn State well. Danny Dennis Sutton, I just think this is an edge group that needs to be overhauled. Not seeing a lot of long-term, you know, turn-your-head cornerstone type of pieces. TJ Wanham, he's okay. J.D. Van Clowney, he's fine. Um, but, you know, Danny, uh, Danny Dennis Sutton, six foot five, 270 pounds, been uber productive this year at Penn State and, uh, you know, just kind of done it a lot of different ways too. So I've been really impressed with him. And I definitely think a guy who's been a little under talked when it comes to this, you know, kind of second round edge conversation to the Cleveland Browns here at 35. Talked about him earlier, but Josh Simmons, no doubt one of the clear winners so far this year off the tackle group. I don't know if he'll rise up so high to be like passing banks and Will Campbell for me, but these guys are also getting some guard conversation right now, depending on arm length measurements and whatnot. So I'll wait to the combine before I move those guys from one position to another. But Simmons, man, like I'm seeing a lot of Paris Johnson Jr. Yes, I know that's helmet scouting, but nibble on his feet. Big athletic guy who's great in the run game, making strides as a pass protector. Also, Cleveland drafted an Ohio State guy last year in the second round. What's stopping him from doing it this year? I think they're looking for that left tackle in the future. And I think Josh Simmons definitely fits with what they're trying to do. To the Jags here at 36, I'm going to go with Kenneth Grant. Could easily be a first rounder. Bruce Feldman, freaks list guy. Awesome against the run. Pass rush upside. And I think the middle of that defensive line is looking for a bit of an upgrade. Especially if Eric Armstead continues to like insist that he wants to play on the edge. I found that a little interesting as I you know kind of hear that throughout the season. If they can get him inside, then I'd love to see the one-two punch of Armstead and Grant next to each other. Plus Walker and Heinz Allen. But they'll figure that out. Right now the edge group's looking a little better. Interior group. Looking like it could use an upgrade, and I think Kenneth Grant would be just that. To the Chicago Bears, I'm going to go to the interior offensive line, Jonas Savanaya. He could definitely be a first-rounder. I've talked about him as a tackle. Here, let's just say he plays right guard, and this is your Nate Davis replacement. I, I don't know if there's a guy more disliked right now by Bears fans than Nate Davis. Uh, so, yeah, looking for that right guard replacement. I think Savanaya, movement skills, definitely fit with that zone blocking scheme that Shane Waldron wants to run. And also a really high-end pass protector, too. So, yeah, you're moving him inside, but I don't think that would be an issue. Help keep Cale Williams upright. That's got to be the mission for Chicago. That was the mission against the Panthers, and he looked awesome. All right, New England Patriots here at uh, 38. I'm going to go to the off-the-tackle well once again. I'm going to go to Wyatt Milam, left tackle for West Virginia. Hasn't had the craziest competition, right? Like, there's no one from Oklahoma State that you're like, oh, that's the tackle edge matchup I've been waiting for. Not really, but... That's not to say that, you know, six foot six, 317 pounds, he hasn't been a rock solid. I like the feet. I like the hands. I like him as a second round guy. Lots of starting experience under his belt too. So for a team looking for a left tackle, I really like Wyatt Milam and that top of the second round conversation. Tennessee Titans here at 39. I'm going to go with Emory Jones Jr. Another one of these guys that maybe he's a guard, maybe he's a tackle. I'll wait to make that determination. Um, been pretty solid as a pass protector. For whatever reason, run blocking grades are a little bit lower this year for PFF. But I, I see a smooth mover. I see a guy with a ton of power, both in the run game, but also with his anchor and pass protection. And uh, hey, if he's a guard, if there's someone who can make it work at tackle, it's the magician himself, Bill Callahan, one of the best offensive line coaches in NFL history. And at this point, I think it's clear. Nicholas petit Friere. I liked him as a mid-round guy, but it's just clear that he's just not working out in Tennessee. So looking for that right tackle option. Emory Jones, assuming he checks out arm length-wise, I definitely think he could be that right tackle replacement and a multiple ball of clay for uh, offensive line coach Bill Callahan. To the Jets here at 40. And we'll, real quick disclaimer, I'm going to go safety here. I thought about making this Drew Aller. Um, I know they have Jordan Travis who drafted him in the fourth round last year, but it's more just to talk about Aller. I think he's been awesome this year. I think he's made a lot of huge improvements. He still misses a few throws that I'm like, come on, Drew. That's not a first round guy. You can't miss that. But from last year to this year, Andy Kolonecki has worked wonders with Aller. And he's got the arm. He's got the size. All that screams NFL upside. But at this point, I think he should go back to Penn State for one more year and have it, you know, one more year working with Andy Kotelnicki. That, I think, puts him into that top of the first round conversation. And basically, you would go into 2026 with Arch Manning at QB1 and Drew Aller at QB2. Both guys probably top five uh, projections, you know. So ultimately, I think he goes back to school. So I did want to make mention of that. But because of that, we're going to go to another Penn State Nitty Lion. Kevin Winston Jr. can play free, can play strong, could play him in the nickel if you needed. Uh 
do it all safety with enough range to be over the top playmaker, but a more than willing tackler and a hard downhill player too that were just put this guy in the box and let him light up some guys. So uh, you name it, he could do it for the Jets. And safety is one of the few spots where I think they could use an upgrade. All right, to the Vegas Raiders here at 41. I think corner's a spot where they're still looking to get a little better. You know, Jack Jones is a good player. Would you know, choose and make the right business decisions. Uh, but Jacorian Bennett, super fast, super athletic, but hasn't been great so far. So Jade Barron, he's been playing outside corner this year for Texas. He also played the nickel. He's also played some safety. So you have a lot of flexibility here with how you want to deploy Jade Barron. And uh, ultimately, maybe that's part of the reason why I like him so much. Just be flexible. Trevon Merrick's a very flexible player. He can play free. He can play strong. Played some nickel at TCU. Nate Hobbs is definitely a nickel player, and he's a good one. So look at outside corner. Maybe you convert him to safety. Going to be interesting to see where the testing numbers come in and what maybe group he fits a little bit better into. But he's playing outside corner right now for Texas, and right now I think he could be an upgrade over Ja'Korian Bennett. To the Arizona Cardinals here at uh, 42. Interior of the line for the next couple of picks. We're going to start with uh, Tate Ratledge. I think right now, right guard, obviously Will Hernandez is out for the year, so that's not ideal for the Cardinals, but that interior group, I think, could just use some long-term pieces, uh, not a whole lot of guys that you're like, yeah, let that guy be a starter for the next decade. Tate Routledge, I think, has that upside, plays with a ton of power, great pass protector, which I think is huge. Obviously, for a shorter quarterback like that, Kyler Murray, you want to keep a clean interior pocket, give him a clean winner to throw over the middle of the field. Interior pass protector like a Tate Ratledge goes a long way to making that possible for Kyler. As promised, staying in the interior offensive line, well, we're going to go to Tyler Booker here um, at the top of the screen. Uh, uh, yeah, you just look at the Saints interior offensive line, and it's a little rough. Like, Nick Saldaveri, I don't think that's their long-term guy. I know Cesar Ruiz is hurt right now. He's definitely one of those starters. Eric McCoy's a rock-solid starter. But then I point to the other guard spot and say, you could probably get better there. Uh, so, Booker, whether it's at left guard or right guard, I think there's a place for him somewhere to be a starter as early as next year for the New Orleans Saints if they did go in this direction. Indianapolis Coulter up next. I'm going to go Walter Nolan. We're starting to see it. Small staple size so far for Ole Miss, but he's looking like the five-star prospect that AM was so pumped to land. Obviously, he transfers to Ole Miss as a part of this huge NIL dish, dish out by uh, that team this offseason. But that being said, he's looked a whole lot better, been really good against the run. You're seeing the athleticism too as a pass rusher. So if he can keep it up, he might go even higher than this. But right now here at 44, I'm thinking, hey, this is probably your Grover Stewart replacement, who's a solid player, but 32 years old, going to be having a pretty big cap at next year. Could be an opportunity to get younger and cheaper at that position, where you're already paying a lot of money to DeForest Buckner as well. Next up's the Giants here at 45. I'm going to go back to this LSU well. I'm going to go with Kyron Lacey. Been impressed with him, six foot two, 217 pounds. I think this could be their you know, kind of X receiver. Malik Neighbors can do that too, but... He's also a guy who's so electric that let's make him the, you know, let's make him the the Z and let's get him in motion and let's get him off the line of scrimmage, get him a free release. Let's play him in the slot and let him really, you know, instead of two-way goes, let's give this explosive freak three-way goes and leave DBs, you know, searching for dust, you know. So uh, I think Lacey kind of frees him up to, you know, Lacey's going to be the sacrificial X to say, and then that lets you do a lot of creative fun stuff with uh, Malik Neighbors. Also, the LSU connection is always fun. Reunite those guys. It's kind of receiver U right now. But honestly, I've been thoroughly impressed with Kyra Lacey. Uh, other receivers you could have gone with here, certainly Trey Harris, but uh, you know I don't like the weight on Evan Stewart. I like A.U. Manor. He's kind of that big body guy. They wanted Kenny Galladay to be. Could go there. But between Harris and Lacey, I just think Lacey's a more polished intermediate route runner right now. And that's kind of what ultimately kind of nudged me in the direction of Lacey versus Harris. All right, to the Miami Dolphins. Um, I think this team needs some interior defensive line help. So let's go with Tyleek Williams. Big athlete from Ohio State. Going to plug the run. Zach Sealer's solid. Clayus Campbell can't play forever. I think this is that big body run stopper this team's missing in the middle of that unit. But also a good enough athlete to think, hey, there's pass rush upside there with Williams. Philadelphia Eagles are up next. I'm going to go to uh, Mike Green here, a guy that's really broken out of the scene. Getting a lot of love from Jordan Reed, Mike Renner from ESPN and CBS Sports, respectively. And man, really played well against Ohio State. Got the arm length, got the size, got the strength. You know, it's shades of not one-to-one, -one, but kind of Marshawn Nealon mold where it's like, yeah, he's at a small school. But when it comes to what you want an NFL edge rusher, Mike Green checks damn near every box. So that guy, yes, coming from a small school, but then going to Philadelphia, who's got a great track record of developing these guys. And right now feels like they might be a guy maybe too short. This is the great landing spot for Mike Green. They continue to invest in this position. Totally think this could happen for Philadelphia. Plus, Green going to Philly, you know, like when they bust out the Kelly Green jerseys, it's just going to be 
too easy. We're on to the Seattle Seahawks now at 48. We've already gone offensive line. Will Campbell talked about that. Let's get him to flip over to right tackle. And man, these guards have just been rough. And you could go center Parker Brailsford here. I've done that in past mocks though. So again, not trying to give you guys the same picks week in and week out, but obviously a connection there to Ryan Grubb. Center's been rough to say the least. That could be an option. But I also like the idea of Donovan Jackson, uber athletic, former five-star recruit, totally matches the zone blocking scheme from an athletic standpoint. Play him at left guard. Christian Haynes was better in college at right guard. There are your two starters there on the interior. And then you figure out center, who I'm still holding out hope for Olu Uluwatimi. The fact that they're not starting him makes it a little bit of a red flag, right? They're bringing in Connor Williams off the street to do that instead. So center could definitely be an option here. But I've done the Parker Railsford thing. Let's do Donovan Jackson. Love the upside. Love the movement skills. I think him and Christian Haynes would be a sick guard tandem for this team. All right, sticking it into your offensive line, Green Bay Packers. To me, I'm just tired of seeing Josh Myers be the weak link on this team. And I know a lot of talk goes to tackle, and sometimes Rasheed Walker has some rough reps. But down in, down out, I think Walker's probably a better, more consistent starter than Josh Myers. To me, he is the weak link. So Brailsford, yes, a little light, but awesome movement skills. Fits with what Matt LaFleur wants to do. Another zone blocking scheme uh, in Green Bay. Uh, and you know, we've seen this We've seen this throughout the NFL and its history. It's in recent history a ton, too. Like, you get a difference maker at center, and all of a sudden that run game looks a whole lot more efficient. And I think Parker's Brailsford, uh, Parker Brailsford would do that uh, for Green Bay. But honestly, it's just patching up that one kind of, that, that one last weak link in, in my eyes on that offensive line. Could go tackle. I'm curious to see what Packers fans think about Rasheed Walker. But I think he's serviceable. When he loses, it's rough, but it's not terrible. And to me, again, I think Josh Myers is a weaker link on that O-line. Then we get to the uh, Chicago Bears here at 50. I know we've already uh, gone into your offensive line, but I am going back to that well. I don't know why uh, Mock Draft Database has him listed as a tackle, but we're going to go Jonah Monheim. Uh, he is playing center this year for USC. A bit of a step back, but I think it's just he's new to the position. Movement skills certainly check out, and I think this team is desperate need for an upgrade at center, so Monheim... Pretty easy selection there. Plug and play. We've improved that center and that right guard spot. Again, emphasis on making that run game better and keeping Caleb Williams upright. To the Los Angeles Chargers here at pick number 51. Uh, we're going to go back to the Big Ten. You get a second tight end in this video. Uh, Tyler Warren. I think right now he's probably my tight end too. He's a solid blocker. More than capable receiver. Very athletic. Kind of sneaky when he gets out in the flat and catches and turns up field. He's pretty He's pretty quick. He's pretty athletic. Um, and also, you get like a passing touchdown. So you can do some fun gimmick things with him. But, man, Tyler Warren, just a really solid, across the board, checks a lot of boxes, B to B plus level kind of guy. And a lot of those things. And, you know, I think this team is looking for an upgrade there at tight end. You could go receiver, but I also think the pass catching improvement there at tight end would go a long way and gives you one more threat over the middle of the field. And, you go into year two, hopefully Ladd McConkey takes a step forward. Josh Palmer keeps getting better as a young player. Brendan Rice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So don't think you have to go receiver here. Could attack in a different way just with tight end. On to the San Francisco 49ers at 52. Another new name to talk about here, Donovan Ezeraku. Again, kind of like what I talked about with Pierce earlier. He kind of fits that mold of these guys that they've been looking for. Athletic, twitchy. You have some bend. Ezeraku, six foot, uh, we'll call it six foot two and a half, 247 but freaky long arms. So again, kind of in the mold of Drake Jackson. I think his long arms are longer than Drake Jackson's. Or Leonard Floyd, you know, Ezraku, I think kind of fits what they're looking for. It's that compliment opposite of Nick Bosa. And, you know, I think we think year in and year out, 49ers, they have a great defensive line. This year, more than others, it's been kind of Nick Bosa and then the other guys. So I'd like to see them put some investment in that defensive line, first or second round for sure. And Ezraku, big time riser, been really impressive this year with Boston College. To the Denver Broncos, here at 53, uh, I think Garrett Bowles going into the last year of his contract. Ariante Ursary, been playing a little bit better the last couple of weeks. Still, I think generally a step down from last year. He's been good, just not great. Um, I think he had the opportunity with a great year to be a first rounder. Right now, it's me more good second round conversation around Ursary. But that being said, like I said, Garrett Bowles going to be a free agent. This is your opportunity to draft and replace him. Um, big big, physical, powerful tackle too. So it feels like a guy who could totally fit what Sean Payton's looking to do. Uh, let's get to the Dallas Cowboys then at pick 54. I'm going to give them a uh, Brandon Cooks replacement, Trey Harris. Jalen Tolbert, unfortunately, looked pretty good against my Steelers. With the game-winning touchdown, we're starting to see him come on the last couple of weeks. But Harris, different body type, different skill set. And again, Brandon Cooks getting up there in age. Speed is the thing that the older you get, the more you start, you start to worry about when those guys are going to lose that step. Trey Harris, May not be able to do a whole lot much else, honestly, right now. You know, the last couple of weeks against stiffer competition hasn't stood out as much, but 
As a designated deep threat, I certainly think he could play that role. Brings a little bit more size than Cooks to the position as well. To the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Levante David on another one-year deal. Could certainly go Jalen Walker, but man, been seeing a ton of love for Jahad Campbell. So I want to go at Campbell here instead of Walker. Either one totally works. A linebacker who's playing off ball, but also could totally be a very effective blitzer. And frankly, those guys have been used as very effective blitzers so far this season for their two respective teams. So John Campbell, Jalen Walker, seems looking for that blitzing linebacker that they don't have with Devin White gone. Uh, and also Levante David could draft his replacement. Maybe it's Danny Stutzman uh, instead, but you know maybe you can get Levante David back for another year and let Campbell be that attacking linebacker that, you know again, Devin, Devin White was next to David. Pittsburgh Steelers, I know he's listed as a safety ad. Some Steelers fans are asking about this last week, but uh, do not cons- do not be concerned. Sebastian Castro is just going to play slot. That's that's what he does for Iowa. He's just here listed as a safety. But Pittsburgh Steelers draft a slot corner. It's obviously a position I value, I think, more than most, but definitely more than matches the value here at 56 in my eyes. Um, I think this would improve Steelers' run defense. It certainly makes them a better coverage unit. Leaves a little bit of a question about that other outside corner spot, but I think Castro is a huge, by far and away, upgrade over Benny Bishop. Uh, so, yeah, would love to see the Steelers move in that direction and get a guy like Castro. Uh, then we get to the Baltimore Ravens at 57. I don't know if they need to make this pick. They're really content with their two receiver sets, and say Flowers, Rashad Bateman have been making it work. Also, the draft has Walker last year. But I like A.U. Manor, didn't want to let him get out of the second round. Big body, physical, high point receiver. And I wonder if it's almost just like that. Yeah, we're going to use a second round pick on him. He may not play every down, but when we need that box out receiver, that go up and get it, dude, I like A.U. Manor's our guy. Um, also, Bateman's battled a ton of injuries, too. So, you know, he's just a different body type, generally, than those guys. Even Tess Walker, he's just a different build and a different skill set. So, diversifying the portfolio of those receivers. Well, I know they are playing a whole lot of, you know, 21, a lot of 22. Uh, so a lot of single receiver, a lot of two receiver sets under the belt of Todd Munkin. But maybe that changes next year or they just get a different type of receiver and they use them in the red zone or in those 50-50 situations, whatever, they, whatever the play may call for. To the Atlanta Falcons here at 58. This is where I'm going to have Jalen Walker come off the board. You know, I was just thinking about it. Like linebacker is definitely a spot I think they can get better. So I'm thinking about Raheem Morris. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, why did the Rams end up trading... Uh, Ernest Green, you know, before the season started for a six-round pick to Tennessee. And I was going back to look at it. Obviously, Raheem Morris was the D.C. last year for the Rams, where Ernest was. And he had six sacks last year. So I almost do wonder, for a team that's still looking for more pass rush juice, yes, we drafted an edge rusher, but one guy make a pass rush, it does not. Jalen Walker could be a flexible off-ball linebacker, but also a blitzing guy, kind of like the way Ernest Green was used in Los Angeles with Raheem Morris. I wonder if this is the type of linebacker he could use to kind of add a little bit of something when that pass rush isn't getting home. To me, it's kind of an interesting fit. Falcons fans, let me know what you think. Uh, Buffalo Bills here at 59. I'm going to go with LT Overton. He's a little too, I mean, I don't want to say small per se, but a little thin for the position, we'll call it. Um, and I don't know why they have him as an interior defensive lineman. He is certainly not that. Uh, but a guy that could probably stand to add 10 pounds or so, but just off first step, get off and bend. Like, you just can't teach that type of stuff. So, definitely a special athlete and, uh, uh, you know, Von Miller getting up there in age and obviously it's hit with his suspension. We'll see what happens with him next year. Could see a world where he's not back. Now he's with Greg Rousseau, AJ Epinesa. Feels like they could use one more guy. And he's also a different type of edge rusher than those guys. Epinesa, the power rusher, Rousseau is with length. Over Tim would be when it was speed. So I like adding that. Again, playing mismatch against opposing tackles. To the Detroit Lions here at 60. You know, I don't think it's the world's most pressing need. And I really like the value with Christian Mahogany last year. But Luke Kander has been playing some really good football this year for Cincinnati. Uh, and obviously Frank Ragnall's missed some time. They've had to move Glasgow to center. And I like this as a contingency, right? Like Kandra can play some guard in the event that you do have to move a Glasgow over to center again or because Fragnow is hurt or whatever. You could also draft the center here. But to me, I think the value of Kandra as a guard will figure out the center spot is a little more valuable than like reaching down the board to try to force a center into the spot. It also could be a position you just address later. I don't hate the idea of receiver here, so could also go in that direction. But I've done that in some past mocks. So again, just trying to change things up for you viewers. Honestly, Let's get on to pick 61. This would be super ideal for uh, me in the eyes of, if I was a Texans fan, running back, interior defensive line. The two spots where I think they could use a little bit of a difference maker. TJ Sanders' last couple of weeks been a little bit more quiet. The pass rush grades have fallen a little bit 
as they've gotten to the thick of SEC plays, but uh, I still like what he is as a run defender. I still think there is some juice there as a pass rusher, explosive first step get off. Uh, so yeah, you put him in the middle of that defensive line that right now has a bunch of kind of space eaters, run stopping types, not a lot of difference makers from a pass rush standpoint. I think TJ Sanders gives you what you currently have, getting younger, cheaper at the position, another nice run stopper in the mix. Honestly, probably a better run stopper than someone like a Malik Collins, but also someone who gives you some upside as a pass rusher. This is a team that I was like dying to get Braden Fisk on. Didn't end up happening, but I wonder if TJ Sanders could kind of scratch that itch for me this draft cycle. Watch the Commanders up next. Uh, pick 62, you go with JT to Amaloao or Landon Jackson. To be honest, give me Landon Jackson, 6'7", 280. Um, more hurries this year. Does have more pass rush reps than JTT. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. JTT has four sacks. Jackson with just two. But again, I'm more worried about the 13 hurries than the four hurries that JTT has. Um, and just the fact he's 6'7", 290. Like, that's freaky. But both these guys play with power. Both these guys have freaky long arms. So you could sell me an argument for either one. And for Washington, looking for some long-term pieces there at that edge spot. Some true difference makers, building blocks there at that edge spot. Uh, and Landon Jackson, JTT, I think worth a swing of the bat here at 62. Two more picks to make. Kansas City Chiefs, I've been looking f- to give them this big body X receiver. Could go Nick Anderson, but we've only seen one game and five snaps in total from him. But you know who's really balled out this year? I also like Xavier Restrepo, not a X receiver, but a great slot type. Wish I could have gotten him into the smock. But Gene Higgins has been playing some great football this year for Iowa State. And he is that athletic. Yes, he can stretch the field, but he is that go up and get it, win with physicality, stack against the corner, body positioning. That's his bread and butter. And uh, man, I just think that's a skill set this team's kind of missing, especially on the outside, right? Like Juju Smith-Schuster is kind of playing that Rasheed Rice, you know, space eater over the middle of the field, compliment to Travis Kelsey. The two guys kind of do that. And then Xavier Worthy, they get the ball to him in space, end arounds, big plays, deep shots. You know, and that's kind of what I think Hollywood Brown was going to be used for a little bit, plus maybe a little bit more in the intermediate area. But I think Higgins could be that intermediate winner. He could be the jump ball guy. You know, Pat's looking for someone to just go up and bail him out of this play. He's breaking the pocket, chucks it up deep. Higgins goes up and gets it. You know, I can kind of see that script right in itself. So different type of skill set, different by- type of body type. So I like adding him into the mix on top of all the weapons they do currently have. And then round things out, you know, Buffalo Bills, once again, you have Rasul Douglas getting up there in age. And I think Tommy Hill and his instincts and his feel and zone coverage would be a perfect corner in that defense. So would love to see them make that move. Uh, and again, Rasul Douglas getting up there in age probably a good time to go ahead and start exploring some uh, replacement options. I think Tommy Hill there at 64 is a really, really solid value. And for a team that's now paying a quarterback too, getting a cheap potential starting corner goes a long way to trying to maximize the cap. But guys, that's going to do it for my updated two round mock draft. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Who went too high? Who went too low? And of course, who's your favorite squad? And did you like the picks I gave your team? We'd love to hear those thoughts down below in the comment section. Leave a like if you enjoyed today's video. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and want to see more mock drafts, more draft content in general, because boy, oh boy, we have a lot more on the horizon. Leave me some video ideas too. If you have some ideas, things you want me to talk about, I'm all ears down below in the comment section. But that's going to do it for me. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach, and I'm signing off.